See you. Voilà. Good, thank you. Thank you very much. It's good to see everybody. It is Wednesday. We are now at the end of our third week of this eight week class. Is anybody at all as excited about that fact as me? I am totally stoked. Yes, right. Let's go ahead and get this done, shall we? It always feels terrible to be in school uh, during the summer. Can anybody hear me? online is my sound coming through i've got andrew withal there tyler healy there uh dia patel is here fantastic everybody can hear me online hi if you would make sure you remind me to get uh attendance at the end of class to make sure i've got everybody here okay um now I do want to tell you, uh, for the online students, I haven't finished yours yet. I just took care of my seated students uh, because I had to face them today. I don't have to look you in the eyes and say I didn't do it. But I want the rest of you to know, those of you who turned in papers, I did uh, grade your papers. I, I did the primary evaluation on all of them. Okay, now here's the deal. What I want you to know is that five or six of the papers I just wanted you to fix the papers. They needed a small editing problem. So if you received a grade of one, does not meet expectations, if you'll look in the rubric, you'll see that I said, hey, you needed to do this or you didn't do this. What I fully expect for you to do is to go back and redo that and I will change the grade to give you a meets expectation, okay? So I was looking for a certain set of things. I hope you gave them to me. Uh, about half of you were right on target the first time. The rest of you have to go back and do a little bit of changing. And I did notice that two of you, uh, I picked the two best papers, the ones that really I thought were the best written, and I gave those two papers uh, grades of three. All right, is that okay? So if you got a one, no big deal, go back, give me about another 15 or 20 minutes, half an hour of work, fixing, doing the editing problems that I, I noticed, um, and then resubmit it, and when I go back in, I'll give it a grade. And it always gives you the last grade that you do. And I'm looking up here like I'm looking at you, and I'm just looking in general and talking so that doesn't mean either one of you made a grade of one all right now i'm going to do the same thing with the online class as well if you don't get the grade you want uh feel free to uh redo edit the paper based upon the feedback i will regrade it and give you a grade of two meets uh meets expectations the only way you can't turn that paper one in now is if you haven't turned it in at all but if you want to uh, redo it uh, to improve your grade, I have no problem with that. Yes, Arian. Um, like, what, the second time you need to resubmit five, like, you know. Excuse me? Like, It would help if you did it before final grades were due. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, honestly, it would be best if you do it this week right now. Um, but at the end of the semester, if you come back and say, Chris, I've got a B, how do I get an A? I might go back and say, hey, look, paper number one did not meet expectations. Do you want to go back and edit that up? So when you come back and talk to me about improving your grade at the end of the semester, I'm going to refer you back to all the attempts to edit your work uh, and that kind of stuff. Hey, uh, quiz number three, homework number three, the grade wasn't high enough. Uh, you need to go back and resubmit that quiz. Okay, I see we've got about 10 people online. Does anybody online have a question about how we're going to do the writing assignment grades? Hi, William, good to see you. Talk to me after class so I can get you on the uh, attendance roll. And thank you for that link. Um, I love it when the students share links with me and he shared one based upon uh, last week's or yesterday's lecture and I do appreciate that. Okay, let's see. No questions it looks like, no questions in here. No, no? All right, then. Uh, 
let's go ahead and talk a little bit about uh, module three. Now, if you remember, what I'm arguing this week is that one of the big philosophical questions we've had in philosophy, the history of psychology throughout the four epics, is whether or not we are controlled by some sort of mechanistic, some sort of, excuse me, metaphysical force, some sort of soul, some sort of ghost in the machine, if you will, or is it best to explain, uh, explain humans as being nothing more than just very carefully crafted machines? So is there a soul? Is there something driving the human being? Or are, can we just explain ourselves as chemicals and neurons, etc., cetera, et cetera? Now, uh, what I did on <clears throat> Monday was I talked about the biology of the nervous system. And I want you to know that there are a lot of things we can explain mechanistically uh, with the uh, nervous system. We can go through and uh, ex I can show you exactly how visual information is transmitted all the way from the front to the back of the brain. Okay, and there are a lot of things I can explain, but there are some things that are become more difficult to explain from a mechanistic point of view. What I would like to do, uh, if you don't mind, is talk briefly about this idea of color vision. Now, the weird thing with color vision, it turns out in your retinas, in your retinas, you have these cone cells that are responsible for responding to light uh, photons. Now these cone cells, you have three different cone cells and they're very specific about the wavelength that activates them. Some of these cone cells respond to light at the lower end of the visible spectrum. And you perceive, when they're activated, you perceive sort of the color of blue, if you will. There are some of these cone cells that respond to the higher end of the wave spectrum, and they give you what we would call the red, the color of red. And then you have a third different cone that sort of falls in the middle, if you will, this uh, green cone, if you will. So I can explain to you mechanistically by saying, look, I can look at those cones, and I can say that they respond, uh, they have different proteins in them, different kinds of opsins, Opsins are light sensitive proteins. When light hits an opsin, that opsin does whatever it's designed to do. You have three different opsins, one kind of opsin in each of those cone cells that responds only to a specific kind of light wavelength. And then that information is transmitted all the way to your back of your brain. And I can even point to spots in V4 of your occipital cortex. I can point to spots and I can say that right there is act. When you see red, that spot right there on your brain activates. And I can draw a link all the way from one to the to the one end of your brain to the other. And I can mechanistically explain that. However, what we do notice is that the system also acts in ways that suggest it's organized by experience, if nothing else. So there are weird sort of visual patterns uh, that we see. So, uh, for example, for example, there's this thing called color constancy. I want you to look at, this is one of those uh, parachutes, right, flapping in the wind. And look at this. Notice that we have a green stripe down here and we have a green stripe up here. We have a blue stripe down here and a blue stripe up here. Now, I'm going to guess that all of you probably would say, yep, that's the same blue uh, here that's here. You would probably say that. And I say, if I asked you, what about this green and that green? You probably would report to me in a sense, yeah, I see that those are the same color. Those aren't different colors, right? And why would you come to that conclusion? What are you judging that on? Patterns. Patterns, and this looks like it's in the shade up here, right? Now, in an entirely mechanistic point of view, I have to just say what cones were activated in the eye. But it turns out that even though, and these cone colors are, and patterns are going to be distinctly different from this because of the light photons actually coming in your eye. But your brain goes back and re-corrects 
the images to say, no, that was actually the same thing that we saw. Let me give you a better example of this. Okay, look at this pink up here, this pink envelope here, and this pink envelope there. Do they look the same or do they look different? Excuse me? Do they look like they're the different shade? I would say the same. What now? It looks like a brighter shade on top. You know how this story is supposed to go, so that might have changed your mind. But the one on top looks brighter, right? They're actually the same color pink. They're the exact hue, the exact vibrance, the exact same color. But what we've got is a pink hue around the first one. And your brain, your brain goes in and corrects the mechanical information that your rods and cones have already collected. Your rods and cones collected information that said these two should be the same on my retina. But by the time they get back to your brain, your brain does something. It changes it around based upon its best guess about what's occurring in that context. And maybe even, so what I want to convince you of today is it really, when we think about the brain's functioning and perceiving the world in our conscious experience, we need to talk about both sensation and this secondary process called perception. Sensation is the process of your rods and cones or your mechanoreceptors on your hands or the mechanoreceptors in your ears, the little hair cells. Sensation is the process of those things being stimulated and then generating patterns of action potentials that travel to one part of your brain. That's what we call sensation. But there's a second process in the conscious experience of the world, and that's what we'll call perception. And perception is when you try to make sense out of what it is you saw okay, or felt or sensed. So I bit into this thing. I noticed it was tart, it was juicy, it was sweet, and it was very, very crunchy. What kind of fruit did I bite into? Apple. Apple. So in a sense, your brain took all of those sensory experiences and built a guess, a best guess about what it is it was eating. Now, I've never tried this myself because the thought just disgusts me, but part of what they say eating an apple is your sensory experience is your smell too. So they tell me if you hold your nose and take a bite of an apple, it'll be very, very similar to, I mean, to a bite of a potato, a potato, it'll be very similar to the bite of an apple. Now, I'm not going to do that and I wouldn't even suggest you do that. But I've heard that part of the sensory experience comes from that final bit of aroma that you get in your nose. So in a sense, what we can say is human beings, we take our sensory information in. The system is built for sensory information. But then over your course of your life, you learn to uh, look for patterns in that sensory information that gives you uh, what we'll call the final perception of what it is you are seeing. So for example, if I asked you to guess, is that an A or a V laying down there, what would you say? V. Why would you say V? Because I could assume the word if it was a V. Oh, because you're making a guess about what it is uh, that, that's more likely. So L-O-A-E doesn't really mean anything, but L-O... VE means an awful lot. So in a sense, what you are doing is you're using this quality of the human brain called top-down processing. And this is where I would say uh, computers are just catching up to us. Most of the time in co uh, computer systems, back in the day when they designed computer system, the computer system had to see the whole image in order to make a judgment. If it doesn't get all of the information, if you leave a block box blank, the web page will error on you. Need to fill in your birth date. Need to fill in this or that. Human beings don't need all the boxes filled in. We'll get three or four of the boxes at the top and then guess what goes on underneath. That's what we call 
top-down processing. And human beings do a lot more of this top-down processing. Now, top-down processing require, requires that you have a guess, an a priori guess of what it is you're looking for. And so the weird thing is we're now moving away from this mechanism and we're now talking about you've got expectations, you expect to see things, you're looking for things. Now all of a sudden we're starting to add in this whatever it is in this middle, this organizing force, this soul, if you want to. Now, let me give you some examples. I'd like to, if you don't mind, I'm going to take you to one of my favorite websites just to give you uh, some examples of this. Let's see, this, where's my favorite one? Right here. Let's take a look at this one. I think you'll find this neat. Every, hopefully those of you online can see this as well. All right. So what are, you, what are you looking at here? Can somebody describe what it is they see? Yes, ma'am, Isabella. Ah, did anybody see anything else? Okay, Isabella's sharp. She's super duper sharp. What most people initially see is a circle of balls rolling around. Do you see that? Okay, now stop and look at any one of the individual balls and look at its individual movement, right? <coughs> Isabella, you're way cleverer than me. I looked at it going, huh? Okay, but what your brain is doing, your brain is installing circular motion over this. There is no circular motion in this. Your brain instead uh, puts that on top of what you're looking at. That's what we'll call uh, a gestalt process. Do you remember in chapter one, we talked about the gestalt psychologist in the sec second epic of psychology? No, you don't. You probably don't even, a couple of you might have written that on your paper. Okay, but those people were interested in how people work in a whole unit. They would become the social psychologist. And what they first realized was we don't perceive the world atomistically. We look at it as a whole. So we're not looking at each of these colors as an individual. We look at them as a whole and judge what whole movement is going on. Let's see, hold on real quick. Okay, yeah, you, you folks should be able to see that. All right, so let's see. All right, how about this one? Let's go back a minute. This is called the 2C motion. Uh, Hold on, let's see what we got here. Any technical problems? No, okay. How about this one? What do you see here? Anybody know what this is? It's a bunch, it's somebody walking, right? Do you see that? But really, I mean, if you wanted to describe this atomistically, what are these? Dots. But what have you done? You've added in that second thing. You've added something to the perception. You've made a guess about what it is you are looking for. And there are tons of examples of these things um, in what we call visual illusions. Visual illusions are always our brain trying to guess what it is we are looking at. Oh, here's a cool one. How about this one? All right. Let's see. Let's get this speeding up just a little bit. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so, uh, all right, which of these orange circles looks bigger? One on the right? Are you sure? 
Right, right. It looks bigger. And what, of course, is the uh, correct answer? They are the same. Okay. So, and you know, the weird thing is, so when our, our sensation are the patterns of neural activity, when you see red, when you see colors, when you see lines, but then our brain tries to put something on top of that, tries to make sense out of that. And so really, the part of learning to, if let's say you were blind your entire life, and today I fixed your eyes so they worked for the first time, your eyes might work, but you wouldn't know what it is you're seeing because part of that comes from your experience, these clues that you have learned. Now, here's the weird thing. Sometimes these clues uh, can lead us astray. Uh, could somebody please for me, y'all take out a piece of paper real quick if you've got one. Actually, nope, 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 none of these, none of these. This is what I want you to draw. Draw that picture right there for me. All right, those of you who are online, uh, you should see my little three-prong picture here. I notice we've got about added in motion, the person walking. Yes, absolutely. Sarah Gabriel, good answer. Hello, Nabila, good to see you. Added in the motion. Yep, good job, Stephanie. Fantastic. All right. Zitsky's here, Torrance is here, Noah Grussenmeyer, Noah's here, yes. Landon Hauser, Mahika, Isabella's here, Mamie, Sai, Angel Torres, Mariana's here, Andrew, Andrew Withow, Gloria Bahati, where's Gloria, Ryan Chapin, Christine Landon Hauser. Ha, ah, very good. Uh, Stephanie is right. It is an optical illusion. It depends. What do we notice about this? Right. And this is nothing, right? This is just the other side of this three-dimensional structure. It doesn't actually exist in the real world. Do you see that? I mean, has anybody drawn it? Who's drawn it? Oh, oh, there you go. Nicely done. William Bozitsky got it drawn. Dang, wait a minute. Did you draw it? Not well, <laughs> I tried. That's, that's all right. <laughs> I don't even know if that's right. I'm there trying, it is. it is. It's so hard for me to look, I can't even tell. Wow, you folks are much better at this than me, all right? But the weird thing is, on this side it looks like three, and on this side it definitely is Two, but our brain sort of doesn't, it, it sort of messes up the middle. We're just paying attention to the edges, all right? So, what the whole point of these, oh, okay, yeah, wow. Let's go back to class. Okay, so, um, really, what I want to suggest to you is that one of the ways in which our brain actually in a sense has an organizing force is you can think about how we organize our visual perceptions.
Okay, uh, so we've got your book's going to talk about what they call just gestalt principles of perception. And these are just ways in which we organize the visual information in our world. For example, for example, when I look at you, I don't see 23 students. Instead, I see rows of students. Okay, and so that's sort of a first level organization of what I've done in this classroom. As I look around, I see some females that some students that are female and some students that look male. I see some students that are wearing dark clothes and then there are one, two, three of you wearing light shirts. In a sense, what these uh, Gestalt principles suggest is that human beings organize their uh, perceptual world. So we've got the illusory contours, uh, we close items. So you see a square here and you see a triangle here. You don't see the individual shapes. Your brain does the final work and puts this stuff together. Sometimes it works and sometimes when it doesn't, we experience what we would call a visual illusion. But visual illusions, in a sense, they aren't a statement about how your brain screws up. They're not at all. They instead show you how wonderfully your brain organizes your principles. And visual illusions just happen to be those sensory experiences that fall in the cracks of human perceptive process. So really, a, a visual illusion just demonstrates an overall process for how we organize our visual world. So I had the Tennessee football stadium up there, which I think is a better way to demonstrate similarity. When you looked at that Tennessee stadium, actually, I'll do it, I'll do it right here, that Tennessee Stadium, what you'll notice if you're looking around this stadium is that you don't see fans, you don't see an individual people. Instead, you organize it into orange and white sections. And can anybody tell me where the uh, opposing fans are sitting? Pretty obvious, huh? Right, right. It always disappoints me when I go see my beloved Tar Heels play NC State because there's always way too big a red spot in that one side of the football field. So you can think of these as ways in which we organize uh, our, visual, uh, our visual world. Now, not only do we do that with, uh, with, uh, with uh, just general organizing principles, but we actually learn about depth perception the same way. Even though our brains do have a built-in uh, three-dimensional way of, of determining depth perception. It's called binocular disparity. Okay, we have that. So you've got these muscles on your eyes. Okay, two things that determine binocular disparity. Number one is you've got two eyes that are seeing some something from a slightly different angle. So my right eye sees you this way. If I close that eye and go to this eye, you switch position just a little bit, just a little bit. That binocular disparity along with the tension that I feel on my eyes. If you ever bring something close into you and you're focused on it, you'll notice as it gets close to you, you can feel the pull on these outside muscles. Your brain uses the pull on the outside muscles and the visual disparity to determine how far objects are away from you in space. It's hard to believe, but it's all calculated in your visual cortex, these distances, so that you can actually tell how far somebody is away from you. And if you've ever seen athletes before, excuse me, if you've ever seen athletes uh, do amazing things. They'll throw a football 50 yards. They'll shoot a three-pointer. And you say, wow, uh, how can you do that accurately? You have to be able to tell how far things are from you exactly. All right. And people with one eye with monocular vision are going to find it much more difficult 
to play sports related activities. I remember one time I brought in a bunch of ping pong balls and eye patches for my students and I made them put on eye patches and then threw ping pong balls at them. And they're absolutely horrible at catching things one eye because you don't have that real binocular disparity that gives you depth perception. However, over the course of your life, the way you see the world will eventually cause you to develop habits, expectations based upon the way things look. And artists uh, use this to render the third dimension of depth in, uh, in, uh, on paintings and on flat surfaces. Now, this isn't just about, uh, wow, this is why paintings work. I don't want you to know that. What you need to understand is this, again, represents an organizing principle that your brain engages in prior to processing information. So if you look at this picture right here, what you will notice is that we have a parallel road, but that parallel road at some point meets in a point. Do you notice that? And what we've noticed from our life is that when parallel lines go away from us far enough, they seem to run together. And so we get this linear perspective now, we also know how big patterns are. So do you see the space between this line and that line? It's about 20, 25 feet, right? Now, if you look farther back here, you'll notice that the space between those lines gets much smaller and then goes away. Because we know that that space in that line shouldn't change, the fact that the texture changes gives us the idea of uh, of perception. Now, here's the deal. I'm looking at uh, I'm, I'm looking at William and Frederick right now. I can tell you even with one eye closed that William is closer to me than Frederick is for two reasons. Number one, as I look at you, you are lower in my visual field. And things that are lower in the visual field tend to be closer than things that are higher in the visual field. Also, I can see all of William from here up, but I'm missing a big spot right in the middle of Frederick's chest because your head is in the way. You uh, block part of him out. And so my brain uses those in a sense to make judgments of distance. And so monocular depth cues and gestalt, uh, gestalt, uh, gestalt vision clues that we use uh, demonstrate to us that there is some sort of organizing force that goes on in our person perception. You're not going out there with blank eyes. Every time you go out, you have expectations about what you should see and how things should be organized in your field of vision. How many of you have ever, have any of you ever done those stupid things they have on social media where they prove how you skip over unimportant words and they'll have, most people might not read the blah and they'll switch one word. They'll change it over and you didn't notice that might was instead uh, uh, just spelled another way. But what they do is that people seem to skip over things that they expect because we have sort of, if you will, we have an expectation for what it is we're going to see. Now, when you watch the video uh, for class on Wednesday, and I do hope you watch the video um, about how your brain hallucinates your consciousness, what they're gonna talk about is this idea that perception as we see it, our conscious experience as we feel it, is nothing more than a guessing game that our brain is doing to try and decode what it is in front of us okay now let's talk a little bit about consciousness because i'm going to argue not only do you organize the world in a way sometimes you have difficulty seeing certain things because uh because uh they're they're just perception is sort of a weird thing so what i want to do is i want to see how good you are at paying attention uh, for those of you online, we are getting ready to watch a video and I will text it to you in just a second. But what I want to do is I want to see how good you are at paying attention. All right. So what we're going to do is have you ever been to those uh, sporting events where or have you ever seen one of those things where they take the balls in the cups and they move it around and see how fast you are at keeping up with that ball? 
Okay, we're going to do sort of the same thing in here, except what we're going to do is it's going to be based on basketball passes, okay? So we're going to have two teams on a court uh, playing basketball, and I want you to count how many times the team in white passes the ball. Can you all do that for me? We're going to see if you can catch all these passes. I'm telling you, it's hard. Okay, for those of you at home, I'm going to go to this. Uh, okay, ready? Are y'all ready? And... Go. Is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! The answer is 13. Who got it right? Okay. What else? Did somebody else see something? Okay. But did you see the moonwalking bear? Okay. Okay, be honest. How many the first time, I'm sure some of you have probably seen this before. The first time you saw it, did you miss the moonwalking bear? I missed the moonwalking bear. How many of you missed that? How could you miss the moonwalking bear? It was probably about two feet tall and it moonwalked right across the middle of the screen. How did we miss that? Yeah, 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 of course, of course. Okay. But it walked right across the front of your face, too. Isn't that crazy how that happens? And so the weird thing is, sometimes we set up our expectations about what it is we want to see in the world. And what I want you to think about today is how often in life have you missed the moonwalking bear because you've been looking for something else, right? How often have you missed the moonwalking bear? Right? And so, uh, what I want to talk about, sort of an even weirder thing when we talk about this organizing principle of the brain and this idea that somehow something's controlling it all, is consciousness, okay? So when we get to consciousness, what you're going to see is what I just demonstrated to you, which is uh, inattentional blindness. If I tell you to look for something, you will actually set your attention to focus on just that thing. And this process of organizing our reality is so powerful that things can walk right across the front of our consciousness and we will absolutely miss them, right? Another demonstration is what we'll call uh, change blindness. They do this really cool experiment. What they'll do is they'll have uh, somebody, I, I'll come up to you, uh, it's what we would call a naturalistic observation, okay? What I'll do is I'll approach people walking uh, down the, the block, and I'll come up to you and say, excuse me, sir, can you give me directions? And we'll start talking, and then they do this cornball experiment where somebody walks through with a sheet of plywood or a big picture, and walks right between us. You know how sometimes people will be annoying and right, walk right between you while you're having a conversation? And then what they do is, as they walk by with a sheet of plywood, I leave with the sheet of plywood, and my friend stays there to continue the conversation with you. And the question is, will you notice that you are now talking to a different person than started this conversation with you? And what they find is that people about half of the time won't even realize if something is obvious as the person they are conversing with has changed. They don't even notice it. And occasionally, it even works from males 
to females. So what if a guy comes up and I'm asking you directions, the board comes back by, and then there's a female saying, yeah, and so exactly what were you saying? And the weird thing is people don't even notice that. And the whole point is because we've got these learned expectations that not only look, show the way we organize people in our world, not only how we figure out what colors things are, but really how we even perceive our basic reality. Now, thinking about this, I want you to think about what it is you believe. What do you know is right and wrong, right? Uh, what is right? Um, are all people this? Are all people that? A lot of the beliefs that we have are based on these expectations that we have. I don't know if anybody's following it right now, but we have this upheaval in our country between uh, Republicans and Democrats, right? Liberals and conservatives. And when you walk around, I live in both worlds because I'm a, a, a liberal Democrat and I hang out with my educational friends, but then I'm also from Alabama. And so I go and I hang out with my family and they got a decidedly different point of view. And so I hear these two worlds and it's like two different Americas that I hear about on any given day. And you ask yourself, how can these people be looking at the same world and yet see two things that are so completely different, right? Right? And so sometimes what that does for me is instead of being more mouthy and more convinced about how right I am, sometimes I spend a lot of time second guessing myself, asking myself if I really am seeing what it is I think I see. Uh, when we get to the uh, uh, social psychology chapter of this class, we're actually gonna talk about implicit attitudes. Actually, each and every one of you have a set of attitudes that control how you process information that you are not even aware of. So maybe you were brought up in a sexist environment where women stayed home and did this and this and this. Even though you may grow up and not believe that, the fact that that was you saw those images your entire life, it actually affects the way you process information. So later on this semester, we're actually gonna to test to see what implicit biases each of you, uh, and I'll also show you my, my weaknesses as well, and we'll find out uh, sort of how these things that we're not even aware of organize our very perception. Okay, now, one of the ways if you don't mind, I'm going to finish in about 15 minutes. Let's talk a little bit about sleep, okay? Because that's one form of consciousness that really seems to blow people's mind. It seems to be the most interesting thing uh, about consciousness is how it changes throughout the day. Not only do we have a set level of consciousness right now, not only is that consciousness limited, I'm not seeing the moonwalking bear, that consciousness is going to change throughout the day. Each and every one of us goes through a very distinct change in the pattern of our consciousness every day. Every last one of you, every last one of us goes to sleep at about the same time every day and our consciousness drastically changes for about five to eight hours depending upon how lucky you are. And we, that happens to us each and every day of our life. And the crazy thing is we are all on pretty much the same pattern. Now, if you're the kind of person that sleeps during the day, chances are you have a kind of job that makes you stay up at night. And you're probably not happy about it either, right? Night shift people uh, do have more sleep problems. But let's talk a little bit about this changing consciousness. It turns out that humans do have a 24-hour cycle of sleeping and waking. What you may or may not know is that you've got a little structure in your brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. It's right there in your hypothalamus. Your hypothalamus is that part of your brain that controls all your motivated behavior. If you're too cold and you want a jacket on, that's your hypothalamus talking. If you're thirsty and want something to drink, that's your hypothalamus talking. If you're a little bit sexy and you want to meet somebody for a hookup, that's your hypothalamus talking. If you're kind of sleepy, 
that's your hypothalamus talking. It's a little structure in your brain. And inside of it is a set of neurons, the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And their job is to make you go to sleep once every 24 hours for about eight hours. Now, this suprachiasmatic nucleus works. Uh, if you, uh, this suprachiasmatic nucleus, if you were to destroy it, the human being would lose all sleep periodicity. So you would quit sleeping like a normal human being. Uh, anybody, wait, we have children, right? Do you remember the first three or four weeks of your kid's life? When did they sleep? Just whenever the hell she wanted to, right? That is because that little suprachiasmatic nucleus hasn't myelinated yet. And so that's why babies just, they sleep randomly for the first six to eight weeks. Once that myelinates, you then have this timekeeper, which keeps you waking up and going to sleep every time, every 24 hours. Now, if you destroy it, the sleep cycle will completely go away. Now, here's a neat thing about that suprachiasmatic nucleus. It's actually connected to your eyeballs. Those uh, optic nerves, remember I told you the rods and cones, they carry light information. Well, most of those fibers go to back here to your visual field, but a few of them go to this suprachiasmatic nucleus and they tell your suprachiasmatic nucleus what time of day it is. So at, when there's sunlight out, these nerves are sending active, they are active, and they are sending information to your suprachiasmatic nucleus. As soon, and your suprachiasmatic nucleus doesn't do anything. But when the sun goes down and these neurons quit telling your suprachiasmatic nucleus to stop, it starts working and it causes your pineal gland to start releasing, releasing melatonin, which puts you into the sleepy mood. Okay, so if you look back here, what you notice is you got a suprachiasmatic nucleus, receives it inputs from your eyes and it's sensitive to light. It communicates with your pineal gland and it will uh, put you to sleep at night. Your melatonin kind of helps you go to sleep at night. Now, uh, there's one other structure I do want to mention while we're here. Uh, when you go to sleep at night and you have those crazy dreams, if you've ever had, does anybody have scary dreams? Man, I've always got the ones where they're trying to cut my head off or something. I hate that, right? And you run, you're running, right? Well, it turns out if you looked at a brain while they're dreaming, that your uh, motor cortex and your legs would be activated. It would really be trying, your brain would be trying to run your body. But what, what now? You can't run in your, are you always stuck in mud or something? I don't know, I would, like, I would try running, but like, I would just Oh, really? That's because you're not actually getting anywhere. Your brain wants to run. The crazy thing is you've got this uh, pons, which actually depresses your muscle tone in your body while you're dreaming so that you don't thrash around. So your brain's wanting to run, but your body won't run. So. In your dreams, you're trying to get away from the monster, but you can never get away from the monster. Is that why you wake up really tired when you have that fall in dream? I hate that, yeah, and you sort of feel like you've hit. Yeah. Now, the weird thing is, has anybody ever woken up and been paralyzed coming out of a dream? Oh, my God. Yes. Okay. Really? Okay. Well, what happens is you wake up, but your pawns hadn't let up yet. So your pond, you're waking up out of a dream and your pond's is still paralyzing you and it takes you a couple of seconds. How long does it take you to? Uh, I think the longest I've had was probably like three minutes. What? Right, isn't that weird? Right, so, so, uh, so yeah, these are the structures that you got. And I do want you to know that you actually have some nerve fibers that come into that. Uh, it's the retinohypothalamic tract is what it's called. And it just comes right into your 
uh, pineal into your suprachiasmatic nucleus in the base of your brain. And that kind of keeps you going on this 24 hour clock. Now, the crazy thing is they know that this works without light because they've done these experiments where they take people down into caves for an extended period of time. And you take the clocks away, you take the TV away, you take anything that gives even the hint of time away to a person, okay, especially the light. And then you say, all right, when are they going to go to sleep and how long are they going to sleep? And it turns out that people, even in the absence of light, as long as they have the suprachiasmatic nucleus, they still run on a 24 and somewhere between 24 hours and 11 minutes or 25 hours, depending upon your research study. The idea is people would actually have a little bit longer day if they could. And do you know what people do with that extra time every day? They sleep. They stay up the same amount of time, but they sleep a little longer. Yeah, you had a hand raised? Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Are there any like, differences within males and females? Do we know how all respect hormones work on Right, right. There are no demonstrated differences uh, between male and female sleep habits, even though you're right, they are both sort of hormone driven. That's interesting. No, I, I, I can't say that. Although I do know that sleep patterns change over the course of the life, and I'm not sure if that's related to hormone, but there are no hormonal differences between male and females. That's a great question. That's a great question. Now, uh, quickly, as I mentioned on Monday, the EEGs are what they use uh, in sleep research. That's where you'll find EEGs most of the time used. They're used in sleep research. Uh, interesting uh, story, uh, EEGs were invented by a Nazi scientist who was looking for psychic energy, kind of like the soul, if you will. And he didn't find psychic energy, but he found that the brain generated electrical activity that you could actually measure. Remember, this is back in uh, 19, God, 18, I think it was, that he invented this. Um, and so he discovered that the brain generated electrical activity. He called the, the electrical activity alpha waves. And they thought, cool, brains generate this electrical activity. But they did, he did this cool experiment. He asked the people to think. And when they think, their brain thought, when they think, when they thought, their brain still generated electricity, but the electricity changed. And it changed to these waves they called beta waves. So alpha waves is what your brain's generated when you're not paying attention to my lecture and you're back there in the back of the class sleeping. And when you're sitting here thinking about a really hard question, your brain is generating beta waves. And so what Kleitman and people with the EEGs found is not only does your brain generate electrical activity, these magnetic waves, but that this wave information changes drastically uh, uh, can, depending upon what you are doing. Now, two guys, Nathaniel Kleitman and William DeMint, actually won the Nobel Peace Prize uh, the Nobel Prize, excuse me, uh, because they took the EEGs and discovered that your brain goes through this very bizarre phenomenon when you sleep. They discovered REM sleep because the thinking used to be is when you go to sleep at night, your brain slows down. And what you'll notice is that when people do go to sleep at night, their brain activity does slow down. So your normal waking state, you're generating these little beta waves. See how they're really small, not a very high wavelength, and they're kind of jaggedy and they're not rhythmic, and that's because you're focused. But as you're laying on the couch watching TV or 30 minutes into my lecture, your brain activity is going to get a little more rhythmic and those waves are going to get a little bit bigger. And then as you start to fall asleep, okay, and I can see it out here. I can see when your eyes closed, you're in what we call stage one sleep. You can hear me talking, but you're not really awake. You're somewhere sort of in that middle stage. And if somebody, if I came over and did this, you'd be like, what? My eyes were just closed. I'm, I'm listening, Dr. Roddenberry. No, you're not. You're on your way to sleep. And then what they noticed is in your, your waves keep getting bigger and slower, just like we'd expect. The brain's slowing down. And then uh, when, you, when your brain starts generating these things called sleep spindles, that's when you're really, really, really asleep. You're in light sleep. 
Now what they found was if you let somebody keep sleeping even longer, they go into what they called slow wave sleep. Look at how big and sloppy these waves are. This brain is super duper slow. And what Kleidman and DeMint found was when you put EEGs on people's brains as they slept for the first half hour, this is exactly what happened. The brain started going back to slowing down. But then something weird would happen. The brain started waking back up. So it was all delta waves and then the delta waves would go away and it would just be these sleep spindles in K-complex. And then they would go away and it would be the theta waves. And then the person's brain activity would change back to beta waves, but they'd be dead asleep. And so what they found was that when our brain goes into REM sleep about five times a night, your brain will actually become just as focused as if you're watching a basketball championship, a sporting event, you're focused on an exam. Your brain actually becomes just as active as if you were awake, focusing just as hard as you possibly could. And the crazy thing is your brain is going to cycle back and forth between REM sleep and slow wave sleep. One, two, three, four, and five times a night. This is what happens to normal people. We lay down, it should take you about 10 minutes to fall asleep. Anybody take longer? Oh no, shame on you. Hopefully meditate. Um, count sheep, I don't know. All right, that's a bummer. I do hate it for you. Uh, if you spend a lot of time and struggle every night, uh, you may want to uh, talk to somebody. You don't want to get medicine. Uh, typically, the sleep medicine is really bad for you. Uh, but uh, meditating, there are behavioral ways so you can improve your sleep cycle. Uh, so we fall asleep. We go down into slow wave sleep. You'll notice that we go slow wave sleep, REM sleep. Now, stage two is what we call light sleep. You spend about 50% of your time in light sleep. Okay, 50% of your time, you, I could easily wake you up. Two in the morning, I could come and wake you up, you'd pop right up, you'd be ready and focused. Now, about 20% of your time, you're gonna spend in slow wave sleep. If I was to wake you up out of slow wave sleep, that's like, where am I? What planet am I on? And you take a couple of minutes to figure out where you are. Your brain was in slow wave sleep, or if you wake somebody up out of REM sleep, they're gonna be just as disorganized. But we spend about half of our time in light sleep. Crazy thing is, uh, we get most of our slow wave sleep early in the night. You notice how we spend a lot of time in slow wave here, a lot of time slow wave here, a lot of slow wave here. You get your deepest sleep when you first start your sleep cycle. And then you'll notice there are more dreams towards the end. And that's why everybody remembers their dreams because you wake up in the middle of a dream. You wake up in the middle of a dream. Now the part of your brain that creates permanent memories isn't active, it's called the hippocampus. And so this is why you can never ever remember your dreams. Do you have trouble remembering your dreams unless you have it over and over again? I remember these boys used to catch me and beat me up in my dreams all the time as a little kid a jerk neighbor over the street and I would run and I could never get back to my house but I remember that when most of the time you don't remember your dreams it's because your hippocampus isn't working but you'll notice that we do most of our dreaming at the end of our sleep cycle and most of our deep sleep at the beginning beginning of the cycle now one of the things that is going to happen when you get into your 50s is your brain when you go to sleep it's going to quit going into slow wave sleep you are not going to get deep sleep like you did in your 20s, 30s, and 40s. And this is why all of your parents and your grandparents are always complaining about sleep problems because it's easy to wake them up in the middle of the night. If you've ever been in deep sleep, they can be having a party next door and you won't hear it. You know what I mean? But if you're in light sleep, somebody can be in the next room and can wake you up. Now, one of the things that does happen when we go to sleep at night is our thalamus. All of our senses go through our thalamus. Okay, so all of our conscious senses are processed through this middle part of our brain called the thalamus. It's in the midbrain. And what happens is when we go to sleep at night, 
our uh, pineal gland and our SCN shut the thalamus off. And so that's why when you're sleeping at night, you don't feel your clothes or you don't hear somebody talking or why you can go to sleep and you don't see the light, even though the light is on in your room. Okay. So uh, just a brief note. Let's see. All right. Uh, sleep disorders. Uh, I'm going to let you read about the sleep disorders your own, but I am going to, uh, I am going to leave you with uh, one video before we go. Okay, I do want to describe, actually I'm going to describe two disorders. The first is REM behavioral disorder, RBD. My dad's got it really bad now along with his Parkinson's and he lost his leg 20 years ago. My dad's brain's a, it's a mess. But he has RBD. Every night he has crazy dreams and he beats the hell out of my stepmother in the bed. He thrashes and kicks and fights. And so they actually have to sleep in different rooms because every night when he dreams, he's beaten up whatever it is he's fighting. And that's called REM behavioral disorder. They do have a medicine for those people who thrash about in their dreams, but it is one disorder. And it's sort of like the opposite of what you talked about. You would sometimes wake up and still be paralyzed a little bit. This is the exact opposite. While they're sleeping and dreaming, uh, they're fighting actually in their sleep. That's REM behavioral disorder. And the second one I want to talk to you about is narcolepsy. Okay, Narcolepsy uh, is a rare disorder where people fall straight into REM sleep, straight out of waking consciousness. Now, here's the deal. You will never fall straight into REM sleep. It's just not going to happen to you, William. Okay? Uh, uh, no matter how tired you are, you're going to be awake until you decide to go to sleep. But the weird thing is, people with narcolepsy, when you measure their brains with the EEGs at night, their brain doesn't do that nice cycling like ours does. Theirs is all over the place, and they don't get enough REM sleep at night. Now, the weird thing about REM sleep is, that's the only part of sleep your brain needs. If I was to keep you from sleeping for the next eight nights, which would be a record, Okay, when you came back, you wouldn't have to sleep eight times eight. You wouldn't have to sleep 64 hours to catch up. However, you would spend almost all eight hours in REM sleep. We actually, our body will catch up REM sleep. If you don't, typically we do REM sleep about two, two hours a night. If you pulled an all-nighter and don't go to sleep tonight, when you sleep tomorrow night, you'll only sleep eight hours, but instead of spending two hours in REM sleep, you'll spend four hours in REM sleep. It's called REM rebound. Your brain needs REM sleep. We don't know why. Yes, sir? Which part of the sleep cycle would it cut off? Or like get in the way of? What now? Where, which, so if you don't sleep for pulling all nighter and you double instead of getting two. It would just cycle back and forth between them. So it, it might speed up the cycle? It would speed up the cycle. In fact, if I were to keep you up long enough for seven or eight days, when you fell into sleep, you'd fall right into REM sleep. Okay? And that would be normal if I were to keep you up for five or six or seven days, like Navy SEAL training or something. Right? Now, the weird thing with people with narcolepsy is when they go to sleep at night, they don't get their REM sleep. And so they're walking around during the day and REM sleep will just, uh, it just break into their system and they will just fall, uh, fall asleep. They'll lose consciousness and fall asleep. Um, and this is called uh, 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 narcolepsy. Uh, and um, what I'd like to do is to show you a quick video. It's two minutes about a fellow uh, with narcolepsy. He's called D. Dodd. Uh, sleepy, the sleepy man. And I just want to show you what uh, narcolepsy looks like uh, for this guy. And uh, for those of you at home, I'm going to type a, a link, uh, a description for the uh, video in there so you can watch that. So let's go ahead and without further ado. The 44 year old Mohammed Dowd from Tunbridge, Kent. Every minute of his life is a battle to stay awake. Oh, you don't love at all, man. I'm still alive! Oh, sorry. Oh, that was a bit. 
Before I actually got my diagnosis, I was everything from a lazy bum to a difficult person, personality, all them sort of things, and I felt guilty. As much as I wanted to be normal and carry on, I couldn't be. For Mohammed, even a simple trip to the local shops is... F everything from a lazy bum to a difficult person, personality, all them sort of things, and I felt guilty. As much as I wanted to be normal and carry on, I couldn't be. For Mohammed, even a simple trip to the local shops is fraught with danger. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. I'll just have that overwhelming sense that I've got to lie down and where other people would say, yeah, I'm really tired now, I'm going to go up to bed. They think they fall asleep quite quickly, but it could be a minimum, really, of about 20 minutes. With me, it can be a minimum of 30 seconds. Oh, I feel so tired. You just can't fight it. Possible to fight it. Mohammed, you're on the pavement, you need to wake up. People often think that you're drunk or on drugs or something strange about you and they feel defensive, they want to back away. They don't want to know. And other times people have come and sort of gone through your pockets. It's, um, it's six legs out. These days, Mohammed only ventures out with his care of Aaron. Mohammed. Mohammed. You can't go sleep here, you're on the floor. For his entire adult life, he suffered from severe narcolepsy. Narcoleptics have a compulsion to sleep that's physically overwhelming, and their days can be lost in a world of slumber. Mohammed. Even if I've had a good sleep, I can wake up and within five minutes, ten minutes, I want to go to sleep again. Okay. All right. So, uh... That's really all I wanted to talk about today. I just wanted to uh, uh, introduce a little bit about the idea of consciousness. What I do want you to appreciate is that there is some sort of organizing force that, uh, that creates the way we tend to take, collect, and process the information that we are perceiving. Now, uh, a lot of this is going to be learned. We're going to talk about prior experience and how that affects us. Um, but at some point, it really complicates the description of trying to explain human functioning using a mechanistic point of view. And when you watch the video uh, uh, about Anil, by Anil Seth on your brain hallucinating your consciousness, I'm telling you, it's really going to sort of make you ask some really difficult questions about what consciousness uh, means. And you'll appreciate the difficulty of what we're trying to do now. Um, on, when, on Thursday night, we are, I have some more videos and we're going to talk about conscious experience and how different case studies demonstrate limitations in our conscious experience and how they make, like I said, a mechanistic explanation of brain functioning uh, kind of difficult. And so uh, that's what I want to talk with you about on Thursday night. If you're not coming to the dis do, uh, webinar, please feel free, uh, please do the discussion board so you can get your collaboration points. Uh, again, for those of you who got a one on your writing assignment, it just means I need you to make some edits and resubmit. Feel free to turn in your writing assignment again if you didn't get the grade that you wanted. Uh, any questions, comments? Have a great weekend. Take care. Make sure you stop by and get credit for being here. Some of you walked in late. All right, folks. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Today, y'all have a great day. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to send me a text or an email, and I'll be more than happy to get back in touch with you. It's been great seeing you. Thank you very much. I mean, just a gentle for the video. I couldn't have been more clear. My apologies. Have a great weekend. Hey, take care, Stephanie. Y'all have a great day. It's good to see everybody. Bye. <laughs>
Yes, ma'am. Okay. Unfortunately, I know you, so when I see you walk in, you don't even have to tell me your name now. Bye, Isabella. I wanted to uh, ask a quick question. I am in the midst of applying for a psychology program right now, and I wanted to see if I can maybe chat with you during like office hours or something like that to kind of take advantage of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right now. Sure. So, what do you want to what do you want to talk about? Uh, I want to like I just moved to North Carolina and mm -hmm. I wanted to see maybe you know like schools with good psychology programs mm -hmm. where you graduated. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yes. Just you know get some guidance because I'm very much lost. Yeah. With that. yeah. Sure. Would sure. It be if I come see you during like, office hours or something. Like yeah. Well. Um, Usually, I get here uh, about an hour and a half before class. Okay. I'm willing to do, and I do that yeah. two days a week. Yeah. If not, where would you like? To, we could either meet online or we could meet at. Uh, are you close to this campus? Uh, I like 20 minutes. Mike, because I'm closer to South Campus. I don't know. I'm in the middle of like. I'm by North, like by NC State, so it's like I'm in the middle of all the campuses. Okay, okay, yeah. Um, send me an email and offer a time to meet, and okay. I'll, I'll come to whatever campus you need, or we can do it online. Okay. okay. Awesome. Thank all you. Right. Take care. <laughs>